it's Michelle from Lab Muffin Beauty Science, Chemistry PhD and All Round Nerd, and I am a dinosaur in beauty blogger years. I started my blog in December 2011, and in the last almost 10 years, I have learned a lot as I've read way too deeply into everything. So I had the urge to go through some of my older posts recently, and unsurprisingly, I've said quite a few myths in the past. Like the infamous mineral sunscreens work like umbrellas, probably you take everything I said before 2015 with a grain of salt. Anyway, as I was going through some of my older posts, I noticed a whole bunch of products that I used in the past that I raved about that I don't really use in my routine anymore, so I thought it would be interesting to go through them. If there's a product that you've completely discarded from your routine, as well, let me know in the comments. If you like sciencey beauty content, click the like, the subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. First up, we have the Neostrata Gel Plus. This is a 15% alpha hydroxy acid product. It's got 15% glycolic acid. It is a chemical exfoliant, and I was really into this in 2012. This was a really unusual product back then, especially in Australia. With this higher concentration of glycolic acid, there were like three products. Now it's actually pretty easy to find a chemical exfoliant. There's been so many launched on the market that I've just never had to repurchase this. I still think it's a really great formula. So Neostrata was actually founded by the scientists who did a lot of the pioneering research on alpha hydroxy acids and polyhydroxy acids as well. But the market's changed a lot since then and there are so many great chemical exfoliants that you can buy for a lot less money. And so I don't think it's really worth it to pay top dollar for a relatively simple formula. Neostrata have a lot of really other great products that are quite unique and I would recommend getting those over the Gel Plus. The CoverGirl Lash Blast Waterproof. So I have trichotillomania and this is a hair pulling disorder. I've never really talked about this before because it's something that I've pretty successfully managed to the point where it doesn't really interfere with my life anymore, except in the realm of eyelashes. So basically, trichotillomania is a compulsive hair pulling disorder. It's linked to things like OCD and anxiety. It's reasonably common, about 0.9 to 4% of the population get it at some point in their lives, and it's more common in women. It started for me when I was about nine. When I was stressed or bored, I would just start pulling out strands of hair from my head. It got pretty bad at one point. I had really thin patches. I started getting really frizzy regrowth and my mom gave me some really hideous haircuts to try to hide the regrowth. I started out by pulling out the most perfect thick hairs I could find. And then I eventually redirected myself into only pulling out the kinky frizzy ones, which I don't have that many of, and also my eyelashes. Now when I'm stressed, I'll like search through my hair and look for like a kinky hair to pull out. And also my eyes get really itchy and so I start yanking on loose eyelashes. A lot of the time when my eyes are itchy, it is actually a loose eyelash. And I also wear rigid contact lenses at night. And if I get a loose eyelash in my eye at the same time as the rigid contact lens, it's really, really painful. So it's actually not that bad a situation to not have loose eyelashes for me, but it does mean that I have really patchy eyelashes. For a while in my early 20s, I cared a lot about this because everyone on YouTube had really big eyelashes. They were all putting on false eyelashes. I think it's still a bit like this now. I used Latisse to grow eyelashes. I got eyelash extensions once, but that was actually a really bad idea because it actually gave me better grip to pull out eyelashes. But eventually I stopped caring and I wear really thick eyeliner anyway, so it doesn't really seem to make a massive difference. But if you're wondering why I never wear mascara or false eyelashes, that's why. Australian natural skincare. So I'm Australian and these brands are really big here. They're also really reasonably priced. You get them a lot in like goodie bags from retailers and I buy a lot of rosehip oil. They all sell rosehip oil. And a lot of the time when you buy rosehip oil, you get a little sachet of another one of their products. They also send out PR samples to Australian bloggers. And so between 2011 and 2013, I used a lot of these products and they worked really well on my skin. They tend to have essential oils, which isn't great for sensitive skin, but the only brand that I really reacted to was Sukin. But there are two big reasons why I've drifted away from these products. Firstly, they have a shorter shelf life. They use lots of natural extracts and oils and they use natural ingredients. And so they tend to go a bit funny in texture after a while. I never notice any mold or anything, but the texture changes were pretty off-putting. And since I try out lots of different products for reviews, I never really got through a container properly. 
The other issue is that these brands tend to lean into those fear-mongering clean beauty denigrating claims. Things like they're free from parabens, there's no nasties. I've talked about the issues with clean beauty before. Probably most brands on the market at the moment have some of these claims but they're all varying levels of that. I think out of these, the worst brand is probably Sukin for these claims. It's a pretty tricky situation and I'm not really sure how I should be approaching it, so maybe some of you have some suggestions. So like I said, I love rosehip oil. I use it a lot. I've been using it a lot recently because you can probably hear it in my voice, but I'm getting over a cold and my nose is really chapped and rosehip oil helps a lot with that. Most of the rosehip oils in Australia come from these brands that have some level of clean marketing. And I get these rosehip oils as PR samples. I don't specifically ask for them, but my mailing address is on some PR databases and I sometimes get them as part of a package from a big retailer. So I have these bottles of rosehip oil lying around. I'm not going to throw them out and buy rosehip oil from somewhere else because that's just a massive waste. I want to be honest about what I'm using on my skin, but I also don't want to be really promoting these brands that use a lot of clean in their marketing. With paid collaborations, I started a policy of not doing paid collaborations with brands that feature clean a lot in their marketing. And I explain it to the brands when I talk to them and hopefully they take on that feedback. But with sharing my routine in my Instagram stories, I'm not really sure where to draw the line. I think most brands now have some level of these clean claims in their marketing and sometimes it's really hard to pick up. Like you won't necessarily see it on their Instagram, sometimes you have to dig into their blog. And I try a lot of different products out and it's really quite labor intensive to spend like two hours searching through everything a brand has ever said before I post like a picture of the six products I use in my routine that day onto social media. And brands change their marketing all the time and so it can be really hard to keep track of that. Anyway, I realize this is a very Michelle specific problem and if anyone has any suggestions, I'd be really grateful. Lush Angels on Bare Skin. I really like this product. It's like a really nice gentle scrub, but again, it's that shelf life issue. I could just never get through a tub of this before it went off. And so I started freezing little nuggets of it in my freezer. I still have some in my freezer, I'm pretty sure. But it's just a bit of a hassle. And so I've been using Skin Foods Pineapple Peeling Gel instead as my physical exfoliant. That's also listed in my 2012 favorites. So clearly I'm just a creature of habit. Netting sponge on a stick. This is a really efficient way of washing your back. And I got this from Daiso, so it was $2.80. The problem is netting sponges tend to grow mold if they don't dry out properly. And since it's all bunched up, it doesn't dry very easily. You'll see all these really scary stories in the medical literature about people getting infections from these infected sponges. And yeah, sponges like this, they hang up, they have skin cells and beauty products all over them and they're wet. And so that's like the perfect place for bacteria to just start having generations of babies. I am actually quite prone to folliculitis. I get it really easily when my skin's irritated and damp. And so I get it when I have laser hair removal, for example, uh, my skin's irritated and I put on that gel afterwards, which is meant to cool it down. That makes me break out in little spots. I get it with period undies because they tend to be synthetic and they also have this printed label on the back and that rubs against my skin. I get it from dance classes when I swivel on my butt because again, it's that irritation and friction. I even get it when I wear synthetic clothing and I don't shower for more than 24 hours, which isn't as gross as it sounds. It's like if I shower in the morning on one day and I don't shower till the evening of the next day, then I tend to break out in little bumps again. Anyway, I have no regular schedule. My life is chaos. I have chaos dragon energy. Energy. So I switched to exfoliating towels instead. These towels, again, you can get it from Daiso. I also got one from Innisfree. And because they're one big sheet, then they dry out a lot more easily. Plus you can just chuck them in the wash. Sesh feet top coat. Is that even how you pronounce it? I feel like I haven't had to say it for like years. Basically, this is this amazing top coat that smooths out your nail polish and makes it look like it's just all one thing. There's no like bumps or anything. It's just smooth and glassy. I pretty much just got lazy and stopped painting my nails as much. And now if I do paint my nails, I want something that lasts for ages. So the way that Sesh Feet works is it kind of just re-dissolves everything and then re-dries it into one smooth layer. But that also means that everything just gets chunked up into one giant layer and so it peels really easily. So now if I paint my nails, I want something that lasts for ages and so Sesh Feet is just not a great option for me. BB Cream. 
So BB cream is like meant to be an all-in-one product. It's got sunscreen and foundation and skincare all in one. But a lot of the time with all-in-one products, it just doesn't quite do really well in any of the domains. It's like a jack of all trades, master of none sort of situation. The big problem with BB cream is that it's really quite pigmented, so it works well as foundation, but you can't really apply enough of it for it to work well as sunscreen. So if you're applying sunscreen underneath it, then the skincare benefits aren't really there either because the skincare isn't going to have an easy time getting to your skin. And so it really just works as foundation. And as a foundation, it's not great because most ranges have like two shades. So now I just tend to use sunscreen and then foundation on top or a tinted sunscreen that isn't really pigmented so I can apply a lot of it, like the right amount for good protection. Benefit Coralista. This is a blush that's like a really pretty coral color with a slight shimmer, and it's like a really natural looking shimmer. I actually said it was pigmented in my review, and back in 2012, compared to other Australian blushes, it probably was. But yeah, there's a lot better products on the market now. And with this product, I think if you're quite pale, then it works quite well. And I think that's the case with a lot of benefit products, to be honest. A lot of them are designed for pale people. So I've switched to a lot more pigmented blushes now that have a bigger shade range. One of my favorites is Milani. So I hope that was an interesting trip down memory lane. Um, do you have products that you've just completely given up on as well? Let me know in the comments. If you like the video, click the like. You can also subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Instagram at Science and check out my blog as well. See you next time for more nerdy beauty talk.